Um, welcome. My name is Justin. I'm here to talk about how we built Atlas with HashiCorp's tools. We make a few open source tools. These aren't all of them, but these are the ones I'm going to talk about mostly today. Um, these are not just products that we created for our customers. These are things that we use ourselves. We had a need for them, building our infrastructure out, and this is why we created most of them. In addition, we offer Hat Atlas, which is our hosted product. It ties all of our open source tools together, providing collaboration, safety, and auditing features uh, for open source tools, making them more robust and enjoyable to use on a team or in an organization. And the first tool that HashiCorp made was Vagrant, and as such, the first hosted solution we had was called Vagrant Cloud. Uh, and this is really the start of Atlas. It offered uh, box hosting, search, and Vagrant Share. Uh, these are really great features that augmented Vagrant. Uh, and that still lives on today within Atlas as Vagrant Enterprise. But today, Atlas contains all these tools, uh, Vagrant Enterprise, uh, Console Enterprise, which provides uh, alerting and a dashboard for console, uh, Terraform Enterprise, uh, Vault Enterprise, which you just saw mentioned this morning at the keynote, uh, Nomad Enterprise, which we didn't talk about today, but is uh, coming shortly. It's going to bring a lot of the same features that Terraform Enterprise brings to Terraform to Nomad. And of course, all these tools are also supported by um, Packer, which is included with all of our Enterprise Atlas offerings. We also offer Private Atlas, which is Atlas that you can run on your own infrastructure. So everything I'm going to mention today is also included within Private Atlas if you uh, happen to go that route. Before we talk about how we build Atlas, I want to talk about what Atlas is. Uh, and this is also what I spend most of my time on. Atlas is primarily a website and API built on Ruby and Rails. And there are a bunch of other services that support um, Atlas, some of which are public facing that you may have seen in, in logs um, or, or requests. There's an Ember front end uh, providing the UI for Atlas, which talks to our API as well as some of our services. And all of our open source tools connect to the Atlas API or these other services in some sort of way. In Atlas, the Rails, I'll, I'll talk about Atlas, both like the entire product and also Atlas is like our, our Rails app. Um, but Atlas is responsible for maintaining the state of the world and then most of our services are generally stateless and reusable. And they're decoupled from the caller as well. And I'll give you an example. Let's say you do a Terraform push. Uh, there's a request that goes through to Atlas uh, and then Atlas creates the appropriate resource for that push, in this case, a configuration version. Uh, and we use a state machine to track the progress of that configuration version. So it starts as like pending. And then each state has a uh, associated service that will handle the next step in processing uh, that resource. So Atlas makes a request to the service. And that request contains a callback URL, which tells the service which um, Atlas to respond to. And this lets us run multiple copies of Atlas in the same environment without spinning up all of our servers. And you'll see later that we have a ton of services for a minimum Atlas install. And this continues on and on until the, uh, our state machine reaches the desired state. And in this case, probably you did a Terraform push and your plans completed successfully. And I might be a little bit biased from staring at it for uh, the past year or so. Um, but this is a fairly simple architecture, especially when you take into account the number of APIs and open source tools that are all using this and the number of features that are within Atlas. Um, everything kind of follows this, this very similar, same similar pattern. We currently deploy to both AWS and Packet. Um, we use Packet. Packet's a fantastic bare metal host, uh, which has a Terraform provider, and we use Packet to isolate our Packer and Terraform builds outside of, outside of the cloud. Um, I'm not going to talk too much more about Packet today, but they're a great provider if you need bare metal for something. Um, overall, the, the services that I mentioned, we, need, we needed <laughs> last year um, over 60 instances just to run the minimal um, Atlas installation, because all of our services require redundancy, so we need at least two of everything, and then possibly more than that, depending on our capacity requirements. Uh, but later, I'll be talking about Nomad and how we, we drastically reduce that instance count. So how do we build those instances with Packer, of course? Um, all of our services, uh, we used Packer to build images, machine images for these instances. We reuse the same Packer config and customize it with variables. And then we use Puppet to abstract and organize some of the details of building those instances. 
And when we first started using Packer, um, the existing puppet configurations that we were already using just still worked. So we didn't really need to change them. That's why we still use Puppet today. It's really more of an artifact of history than like a conscious decision. But it's kind of what's great about all of our tools is that they offer so many different providers and options that you can use them just piecemeal. You don't need to forklift your entire infrastructure. You can just use the parts that you want. So it was great that we could just start using Packer and um, everything just kept working. Each service is stored in its own Git repo and on GitHub. And then uh, in Atlas itself, the there's a matching Packer build configuration. And whenever a build's updated on GitHub, it runs a build in, uh, in Atlas. In order to complete a build, we need uh, credentials for AWS and other types of variables. So in this case, we have uh, AWS credentials as well as an environment name. And you can see on the right, there's that um, sensitive check mark. And those variables are uh, write only. So no developer can see the, the contents of the variable. They can update it if needed. And all of our variables are encrypted with Vault. We use Vault Transit within Atlas to secure all of our customers' data, um, variables, and different um, types of stored data. And the best thing about how we use Vault Transit within Atlas is the simplicity of it. Um, there's a Vault Rails Ruby gem that Seth Vargo made, which is fantastic. Um, you simply just create a new column in your database. This is if you're already using Active Record in Rails. Um, you simply create a column in your database that's uh, suffixed with encrypted, and then you declare in your model that it's a vault encrypted model and you want to encrypt an attribute called data. And then developers can just use that, um, that attribute the same way they would any other Active Record object, and they can even update it the same way they would either by setting it with the accessor or um, setting update. So our developers don't have to work about encrypting or encryption or decryption at all. Uh, we just trust Vault to do it, and it's completely transparent. So it's been really easy to encrypt data uh, when we need to without a lot of work. So now that Packer build completes, uh, we now um, store the artifact in Atlas. So Atlas has an artifact registry, um, and you can see it has metadata describing different things about the artifact. And now we need to deploy it, and so we use Terraform for that. We describe our entire infrastructure in Terraform across all of our providers. And we use modules heavily. Um, modules in Terraform are reusable. They help enforce separation of variables for configuration. And they force you to clarify the flow of data through your, through your Terraform configuration. And Terraform can reference artifacts uh, that we, that artifact that we just uploaded. So we have the uh, Atlas artifact data provider. If you haven't seen data that's new in Terraform uh, 0.7, it used to be uh, resource, resource Atlas artifact. But you can reference an artifact by the specific Atlas version number or the latest, depending on your needs. And similar to Packer, we store Terraform configuration in a Git repo. Um, and every time that configuration is updated in GitHub, uh, we, we queue a plan within Atlas. You can link multiple Atlas environments to the same GitHub repo and changes to master automatically queue a plan. You can also queue a plan manually, for instance, if you're uh, updating variables or if you know an artifact has changed. Terraform also supports variables uh, in the same, same fashion as Packer. There's environment variables, but in addition to those, there's also Terraform variables. Um, and those have the added ability to be set as HCL variables. Also, in new in Terraform 0.7, you can describe a variable as HCL and store more complex HCL data structures instead of just a string to interpolate in your configuration. But both um, Terraform and environment variables can be marked as sensitive, and just like Packer, they're all encrypted with Vault. Once a plan succeeds in Atlas, it must be confirmed before applying, uh, and this is usually after getting approval from a, from a teammate or colleague. And this is ad hoc right now, but we have more complex approval rules coming, coming shortly. We also heavily use Atlas environment locking. This just ensures that Terraform runs happen in serial. Uh, otherwise, if two runs were to occur simultaneously, it could have unexpected consequences on your infrastructure, as well as corrupting your Terraform state file. So we really love that we can just queue a plan whenever we want and not worry about if somebody's already doing something in progress. Um, and the plans and applies, um, we, we store the plan when we run a plan so that you have a, um, 
better known state of what's going to occur when the, when the apply occurs. Atlas will also run plans for GitHub pull requests, um, and it can update the SHA status on success or failure. And these plans don't change infrastructure. They're more of a CI for, for your Terraform configuration. There's one more way that Atlas can queue a plan, and that's when a linked artifact is updated. Um, because Atlas parses your Terraform configuration, it knows about which Atlas artifacts you're using. Whenever an artifact is cha uh, changes, Atlas can automatically uh, queue a plan to update that, that artifact. The other th thing we really love is that Atlas supports notifications. Um, we use Slack, and we use notifications across all of our Atlas products. Uh, it kind of nudges your teammates to you know, review a plan, um, increases visibility if, if there's a packer build failing, and it's just great for a collaboration. Let's talk about Nomad now. Um, like I said earlier, last year, infrastructure essentially looked like this. Each one of these squares was an EC2 instance. Uh, we had some on the left that were servicing load balancer traffic, and on the right we have our core infrastructure services, such as console and vault. And now with Nomad, we now only run instances for our core infrastructure services, console and vault, and we added the uh, Nomad servers, which uh, coordinate all the jobs across all the Nomad clients. And now we just have a few Nomad clients for our availability and uh, capacity requirements. So we went from 60 plus instances for a, a minimal Atlas install to only, um, really, you only need about two or three Nomad clients for a really small capacity. We have much more than that, though. And that, that really helped save, uh, help us save costs, too, on AWS. Every service now has a Nomad job file, which describes um, how to run it, but also how to do a deploy. We run a mixed Nomad workload. Uh, Nomad supports Docker and Rocket containers. Um, and it can also provide isolation without containers by using uh, C groups on Linux, the exec driver. But if you don't need isolation, uh, you can also use raw exec. And then Nomad also supports uh, JVM and QEMU. But it's really great being able to run a mixed workload in, your, in, in our scheduler. And even though we no longer build machine images for all, all of our services, we still do for the core infrastructure services. Um, we still use Packer for building the services because Packer provides a reproducible environment for uh, building a, a static binary in Go, or it can also output a Docker container. Our job files also contain a service block, and Nomad includes console integration. So uh, the service block registers the Nomad job with console, and you can define health checks for the service. So if a developer uh, or a team is creating their own Nomad job file for their service, they can, they can define their checks within that same job file. We then use these health checks with console enterprise, and we get notified when services become unavailable. And those also go to Slack. We configure console enterprise to notify different teams via different notification methods based on the service and severity. So this is the image that you saw this morning, uh, and really what I wanted to drive home was that like, we used to use Terraform to manage both our infrastructure layer and our application runtime layer. And now with Nomad, uh, there's a very clear separation there, whereas Terraform just manages our core infrastructure, and it's much less uh, often changed. And now uh, application developers and service developers can deploy more often with Nomad without interfering with the Terraform configuration. Uh, and Nomad's is still young, but it's already really solid for our deployment, and uh, we're really excited about the features that are coming soon. You may have noticed that um, throughout all the diagrams that Atlas is essentially deploying itself, um, but we do take steps so that if Atlas were to go down, we could still bring it back up again. So for the bare minimum to bootstrap Atlas, we store those artifacts in S3 instead of within Atlas itself. Uh, and that way, if Atlas were to ever go down, we could still bring up a usable cluster. Let's take a quick minute to talk about the future of Atlas, what we have coming, coming shortly. Um, and these are not just things that our customers want, but also things that we want for ourselves. Starting with Terraform Enterprise, um, more powerful approval features instead of just a single discard con conf confirmation. Um, comments on different types of run events, which will allow people to uh, insert intent into what, why they're taking actions. Uh, a redesigned run view, which will allow us to 
displayed the, those first two items chronologically. And uh, also more features from the open source version of Terraform itself we're going to bring into Atlas. There's also Nomad Enterprise coming at some point uh, in the next few quarters. And that will bring similar collaboration and safety features as Terraform Enterprise to Nomad. Uh, so we're really excited to use this ourselves as well as offer it for our customers. Before I finish, I just want to take a minute to talk about, uh, to mention all the people that work on Atlas. Um, Evan, who just was up here, uh, introducing me. But if you see all the, any of these people at the booth, please say hello. And uh, if you have any questions, please, please talk to them about Atlas. And uh, that's it. Thanks.